My name is Ken Berger, and for almost 30 years, I worked for nonprofits that were not managing to outcomes. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and so actually, uh, you know, when I heard Kate's story about the, the nonprofit she worked for and how she still regrets it, I would say to Kate, imagine 30 years. Um, and it's, it's very true, and actually that's part of what puts the fire in my belly and why it's so important to me that the nonprofit sector change and no longer be the way it has been for so long. <clears throat> and uh, so, with that in mind, I was asked to talk about our vision of the hope for the future of the nonprofit sector. Um, so Charity Navigator's been around for 10 years, just quick 20, 30 seconds. We have about 3 million users a year at this point. We estimate that we impact about $10 billion of charitable giving. We're a website. We rate charities from zero to four stars based on their performance currently in two areas. One is finance, and the other is what we are calling accountability and transparency. More accurately, it's governance practices, ethical practices, and how open a charity is with its information about itself to the public in certain measures. And that's where we are right now. Enough of Charity Navigator. Before I tell you about the future, I want to talk about the, the, the current state of things as, as, as I see them. Um, and I guess this is going to sort of dovetail on some of the remarks made earlier by a couple of our colleagues here, I hope. Um, first, there are four areas I want to talk about. One is government and the government problem, as I, as I see it. And, and here is a chart of the nonprofit sector since the early 1960s. 1960 were about 10,000, 15,000 nonprofits that were registered in the United States. So now, now there are over 2 million. And so when, when David, was, David Hunter was talking about the challenge that we face, you also have this phenomenal explosion of competition as well. <clears throat> and although it's been said that there'll be uh, closures, for every closure, the ability for there to be a teeny weeny new organization that uh, survives forever is, is very true. There's a period here of about eight years where the, the sector doubled in just eight years. And so the government problem is that government is imploding on the federal level, on the state level, on the local level. And within that context, they are theoretically are supposed to be monitoring the nonprofit sector. And in fact, it's a joke in many ways because they're not keeping up. If anything, the graph of the, of the government's oversight responsibilities is going like this, in the opposite direction. So the notion that government is going to be able to lead us through this and to help to improve things with that state of affairs, well. <clears throat> and then there's a comment that I think sums it up as far as the nonprofit sector is concerned. And David Hunter has uh, an article I strongly recommend you read called The End of Charity. And what a sobering reality that is for the nonprofit sector. Having been through it for 30 years, I can tell you it's pretty much the way it was for most nonprofits. To this day, there hasn't been that much change for the vast majority of nonprofits. They just cannot show you meaningful evidence of sustainable change in people's lives. That's where we are. Then we have the donors. And we have research on donors that shows that the vast majority of donors are not social investors. They are giving a gift, and their decision in making a gift is largely driven by emotion, personal connection, and very, very little of it is being done based upon performance and outcomes. And in fact, even though, well, at least you could say 12% are looking for, 12% are uh, donating money for high impact, well, the, if you tease out the research even further, it appears that only about 2% of those in the population actually end up really benchmarking and comparing charities for performance when they make these decisions. So that's that reality. And then you have people like Charity Navigator. Um, the reality is that for most of us that are trying to evaluate the performance of charities, given what uh, was observed by Dr. Hunter, the reality is that for the vast majority of charities, the amount of data that you can really look at to compare and see who is really uh, showing the results in many sectors of the nonprofit sector, in many cause areas, there's just no there there. And so the challenge for us is we're often sort of blind. We're, and you know, we 
all of us together still don't know what the elephant looks like. <clears throat> so, there we are. Wasn't that great? Don't you feel great now? That's the state of things today, as far as, as, far as I can see. So, now let's talk about the future. I hope you're inspired at this point and ready for us to talk about something else. Government, the solution for government. God help us. I have four suggestions for those of you in government who are listening today. The first is get out of the IRS, get out of units within government that have no mission or purpose related to the nonprofit sector. The IRS, is, which is where they house the uh, unit for uh, monitoring the nonprofit sector and setting policy and regulation, has a mission to, to bring tax revenue in. So, what kind of prioritization? is the nonprofit sector. They have backlog decisions on policy that go back years. It needs to get out of there and it needs to have independent funding. You know, a small amount of funding comes from uh, taxes to foundations, but I think some creative ways to have sustainable revenue so that the, the ups and downs of politics do not drive this kind of governmental function. <clears throat> of course, government needs to do more and more um, funding of groups like yours. I mean, if I was to say in a nutshell what my dream is, is that uh, for f the reality is with the help of all funders, um, you'll become the norm rather than the exception to the rule and that this place will be filled to the uh, rafters with people like you. You are the cutting edge of this and hopefully government will fund you more and you'll stand your ground and insist that government fund you the right way for the right purposes rather than dumbing down programs. Um, and related to that, the social uh, impact bond, even though it's a misnomer, any kind of way that government can incentivize more and more growth of performance-based organizations and social investing, the better. And lastly, this is uh, a sidebar. So if I look out 10, 20 years, my dream would be that every year, every nonprofit, as a norm, doesn't just get audited for their financial information, they get audited for their results. And that becomes the norm of the sector. Okay, so that's the government dream. Then donors, so there actually has been some good news in the research about donors. If you ask donors what matters most to you, 90% of them say effectiveness matters. So there's hope even in the data there in fact, some studies have said that there's billions of dollars of potential money, even now, that could be unleashed if, if more uh, information was provided to donors. And uh, so just because a donor is connected and has an emotional bond doesn't mean they're also not equally uh, or somewhat interested in the effectiveness of the work. So there's an opportunity here. And I think that as our data, as our information grows, so will the ability for donors to make that choice. You know, there's an argument to be made that part of the reason that a lot of donors don't look at this information is because it's a logical choice. Because for the vast majority of cause areas, there's no there, there's no data. So of course I'm gonna base it on something else because it's not there. But when that day comes, there's evidence that many will flock to the information over time. And then there's the normal nonprofit. And by the way, attribution, Jeff Mason gets a lot of credit for this. I think David Hunter is probably too. Um, the Alliance for Effective Social Investing has been looking to develop a sort of a, a design, a, what does a high-performing nonprofit look like? There have been a lot of iterations of what I'm about to show you. This is the one that I like the best, but uh, it actually has evolved even since then. Here are some of the elements that the nonprofit of the future, we hope, will be normative with. Not surprisingly, you know, we talk about impact and outcomes and results, but the fact of the matter is, if you don't manage your finances well, then you can have the greatest results today, but it's not gonna matter worth a hill of beans in the long run. So you have to have strong fiscal systems in place and sustainability. That will always be the case. So for all of the challenges and weaknesses that uh, we have at the present with our rating systems and whatnot, it still holds that financial health is vitally important to a high-performing nonprofit to sustain itself. Particular measures may change, but the notion of financial health and sustainability is critically important. 
Second, that you have to have basically an ethical organization. And you need to put practices in place to maximize the chance of that happening. Um, in those 30 years, I can't tell you how many scoundrels and thieves I worked for myself or I saw in the field. I think it's an often unstated reality. And so just to sort of bolster the most nonprofits don't manage well, there's also a whole lot of ripoff artists out there. And uh, you've got to have those practices in place. Again, you can have great outcomes today, but if you have minimal systems to reduce the chance of unethical behavior, then it's not going to work for the long term. Last but not least, the core, the most important part, is how the, is how the nonprofit works. And the first step, if, if you see this as sort of a progressive movement across, across the grid, first comes capable leadership. If you don't have the leadership that really is passionate about and focused on moving the organization to a meaningful performance management that drives outcomes, then you should quit. Then you should leave. Then you should go somewhere else. Don't wait 30 years. Go. I tell you. Get out of there. And there are, they, they, they desperately need you. These organizations that are outcome driven where you can actually use your passion and drive change. High performance, which we have in the middle here, is basically defined as a, an organization that is outcome driven, that does put those systems in place, and that everybody in that organization is working toward that goal. It's, it's, I, from what I know, it's most of you out there, so I'm preaching to the choir, so it's somewhat humbling for me. Um, and then there's impact, which in this matrix is defined as that you can rule out all other causation for the results, for the outcomes. And so most organizations may never get here, but you can use the research from uh, that evidence-based research and uh, you know those are great, but we're not looking for everybody to use randomized control trials. So if we can get everybody in that middle, uh, middle place, we'll have a big party. I'm buying. There, there's, two other, there's two other boxes that I don't show, but I wanna just remind you, just to reflect on where we are. There's a box over here. It's called the clueless organization. And I would argue that that's the vast majority of nonprofits today. They're not even on this chart. They're not even buying in. And then there's one way over here, which I know a lot about. It's called the scoundrels and thieves organizations. And there's a lot of them too. So the dream is to get everybody over here. OK. What else? Oh, uh, uh, and so you know, the basic key for us for rating organizations and the like is the key to all of this is meaningful information. That nonprofits actually are going to supply it, we are going to assess it, and donors are going to use it. And the ultimate of all of it is the mission of the Alliance for Effective Social Investing, and hopefully for all of us, it's to drive more money to high performing nonprofits so that we can help change the world and make it a better place. Okay. And so here's just a, this is just a small little sidebar from me and my hope for the future, specifically of Charity Navigator. We have taken our first step to change our rating system. Ultimately, we want to get to outcome measurement, and we're going to try to get there as fast as we can. We took our first baby step forward. We thought it was a baby step. We thought, okay, we're going to add ethical practices of nonprofits and how open they are to their stakeholders. Okay, so we're going to take the first step. Half the charities in our database had a change in their rating. It caused a dramatic change. Why? Well, there's a variety of reasons, but a big one is because of the state of the nonprofit sector today. We really have a long, long way to go. But I got excited. I got really excited because we are seeing the impact and the potential future impact of groups like Charity Navigator. The organizations are now being told, you better start putting this stuff on your website. And in the future, what we're going to be asking them to be putting on their website is the results of independent evaluation, is the evidence of the quality of how they report their results. Before we even got, before we haven't gotten there yet, but organizations are already creating whole new sections on their website of information. I'm not saying that they have it all, 
But the fact that we're seeing this movement in this direction gives us great hope for the future. And then my grand finale. Really, really, really the key to all of this, it's, it's not, I hope that in the future there won't be anybody like me standing up here talking about 30 years of, of not knowing how we did. The, the future really is in your hands because you're the people who are the evangelists, you're on the cutting edge of this. You know, you're sitting in the audience, but you really are the leaders that need to get this word out there. What uh, Robert Egger was talking about, getting active in the political process, what uh, David Hunter was talking about, that you need to fight to get funding for the right things rather than crap. All of those things are incredibly true. It's up to you to make this change. And so, that's the end. <laughs>
to point out that all nonprofits aren't created equal, that some nonprofits have no impact at all, and that giving to those organizations is basically a waste of money, and that there are even some organizations that cause more harm than good. So it's, it's as nonprofits begin, I mean, as um, um, uh, uh, funders, especially individual funders, begin to become aware that there is a difference between nonprofits, I think they're going to be a little more selective about who they give to. While you mention it, when you leave here, this, this auditorium, there are flyers for that book, Leap of Reason. Kate Robinson has them here. And so you should get one, and you should read that book if you haven't. And it, you can get it for free uh, uh, online. Uh, well, actually, there's a surprise for everyone tomorrow. A free yeah. gift! <laughs> Don't forget about the flyer you get the book anyway. Maybe you pass the flyer to a friend. Because it really is an incredible book. And forgive me, because I may flub the way I ask this question, but this concept of nonprofits have to supply the information so we can analyze it. And being from an intermediary organization myself, one of the major barriers that, that the agencies we fund are having is that some of the information doesn't come from within them. The engagement information comes from within them, and some of the progression information comes from within them, but the majority of the real outcomes, great changes, job um, um, retention, uh, you know, matriculation into higher education, uh, recidivism, many of those um, pieces of information are most accurately obtained from other sources. And what I need to understand is how, you know, I'm from city government and we have a hard time engaging the other, um, the state agencies in our state to share that information in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So how do um, folks like yourself and how do major funders start to use their leverage, not just to bring the hammer down on nonprofits, but to, um, to really put the onus on those agencies that house that, that really important information of, and, and, and help us use it, help yeah. us connect yeah. to education, help us connect to the ju justice system so we can really see those long-term effects. That follow-up is almost impossible for some of these smaller agencies. Well, first, first of all, the two things are not mutually exclusive. Nobody, nobody should get a pass. The nonprofits have a fundamental obligation, I believe, to provide meaningful information about the results of their work. Absolutely. So let's not forget that. And in terms of long-term, short-term, mid-term outcomes and all the rest of it, the way things are today, just give me some frickin' outcomes for pity's sake. I mean, let's get started. Um, as it relates to uh, the funders and government, yeah, I'll, I'll scream from the rooftops. Anywhere that I'm given an opportunity to speak, uh, I just criticize the foundation world. Thank you very much. And we are a charity too, so it's a public, it's great. And uh, government as well. Any opportunity that we have, uh, but the, you know, we all have to be doing that. That's what, that was my point. It's not, it can't just be a couple of us standing up here. That's part of the reason why I think Bob Eggers is trying to organize this, uh, this 501c4, because we have to get organized together to get this message out there. Every single one of us, because it's going to be a, I mean, I wrote this thing uh, a while back in the same journal, the philanthropy, uh, Philadelphia Journal of Social Innovation, that uh, this is a battle, we believe, for the soul of the nonprofit sector. And we all have to fight it. It's that big of a deal because people are dying and are not getting services because we're wasting so much time and so much money. Thank you, Ben. That was great. Um, you know, you were talking about um, capable leadership and um, nonprofits sort of transforming themselves into, into high performers and um, having impact. Where do you see the biggest barriers for um, these organizations? And, and what do you want? Thirty years. I mean, that's that's a lot of time. Yeah. But uh, where do you find the most pushback in transforming organizations? You know, just a real quick story. I, I worked the thirty years, right? Uh, within those thirty years, more often than not, I found that the leaders of the human services CEO, uh, human service organizations I worked in, were. Here's the track that would happen. They might come into the field wanting to help, and after a certain number of years, whatever, they became burned out, they became cynical, 
They're surrounded by board members that are wealthy. They're looking at the end of their career, and it's like, I'm getting my piece. It's my turn. I don't have a big pension, and I'm going to retire, and I'm taking my piece. And they became thieves. They became thieves. And that track record, unfortunately, and then, and then there are, you know, I mean, you saw what was going on with the Young Adult Institute recently. There's a lot of people who, who manage to get to the top, not because of their competency. They get to the top because they've wangled their way there. They're good salesmen. They're good bullshit artists with board members. But they're not competent to really do the work. And unfortunately, it is a, a really scary part of our sector. There's a book that just came out called Silence by a guy named Gary Snyder. And he, every month, he churns out this non-profit imperative, and he just churns out one scan, scandal after another. I think it is a big problem in our sector, unfortunately, that we need to start getting serious about. That's part of the reason why I say, our, you know, the thing we just put out on accountability and transparency, people say, oh, come on, let's work on the outcomes. Yes, we want to work on the outcomes, but what a freaking mess we got here. We got a lot of rip-off artists out there. It's not the majority, but it's a lot. Oh, and oh, just one other thing on that. I want to just say one more thing, blockbuster conclusion on that. One of the reasons that I think that managing to outcomes is going to be so transformative on top of everything else that it's going to do is an organization that is truly driven in that way, the likelihood of that sort of crap and nonsense going on incrementally becomes less and less possible. If you're truly dedicating everything and the organization is completely focused in that way, the likelihood that you're going to have people rise up to the top like that is going to by, just by the nature of it, it's going to reduce the likelihood of that. So it has that positive outcome indicator as well. I, I want to talk a bit about this, um, the final cube, the impact. And you talked about um, where we could show there was no other causal effect, right. which seems right. to me impossible. Well, it's, it's to... Let's say, you, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. So I'm kind of just not worrying about that yeah. too much. Yeah. But I am more worried about this notion of hanging our work on randomized control trials. Because I think there's serious ethical issues around that, especially when we're providing services like um, Dr. Hunter talked about, the inevitable trajectory of uh, early, uh, a teen who has a child, and is, you know, and then he painted this really grim, picture. And so if we start withholding services from one group to demonstrate that we're having an effect on another group, and we know that those services may be so critical as to affect the trajectory of somebody else's life, like, there's serious issues around that. Mm -hmm. And even if we look for similarly situated people who didn't receive the service, and if we're working with children, we're still saying to those parents, let me measure your kid who didn't get the service so I can prove that your kid isn't going to do as well as the kid that did get the service who may have, in fact, a better life. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure what lines we want to cross to be able to demonstrate the effectiveness of the services we're provided, providing. Yeah. Uh, remember, I did first want to remind you, the place where I'm having the party is high performing. I'm not having a, I'm not, I'm not, ex, I'm not suggesting or implying that in the, uh, in the intended future, uh, every charity is going to have randomized control trials. That's not what we're saying. But uh, there are, there, there are occasions when randomized control trials can be done. There are occasions when it can't be done. There are ways to make modifications to that traditional model of conducting a randomized control trial where you don't have to have the effects where there are people who are not going to get the service that you want to serve. So I'm not in any way saying that you should uh, give up on the obligation to help as many people as you can to worship at the altar of one type of experimental design. There are plenty of ways to go about doing this. But the bottom line, and I think it's great that we're having a debate like this, because in most audiences it would be sort of like just even getting into this space. I wish we could have this debate more often. But I think the, the notion of do as much as you can, focus as much as you can on trying to get to uh, an outcome-driven culture, evidence-based kind of work, the better off you'll be. Whether you want to do a randomized control trial or not, I don't, I'm not that worried about that. We don't all have to meet that sort of idealized gold standard. It has value, though, and it can be very powerful. I think Nurse Family Partnership has proven that. Um, I, I just want to say that I don't think it is a gold standard if you've withheld service yeah. from somebody else, and it's something different. Yeah. 
and, and that it shouldn't be held up as a high, the highest level because, in fact, it could have... Yeah. Well, I, I'll and, let, and we're not debating. We're just trying to understand one another. David? <laughs> so uh, I just don't want, I want to make a couple of points about randomized control trials. First of all, I don't ad advise anyone to undertake a randomized control trial um, unless there is an, an awesome amount of evidence that they before they undertake that control trial, that first of all, they know what they're doing, they know whom they're serving, and they have tracked their performance for a long time and they have kept up a steady high uh, rate of delivering the model that they are promising to the people they're promising to um, deliver it to, and that they are getting good outcomes. Uh, and that means most nonprofits are never going to be ready for, for a, a, a randomized control trial. But to Ken's point is, if you have in mind that we have to get to that point, you will be doing things, whether or not you ever enter into a randomized control trial, that will make it more likely that you're actually going to be helping people. So I see randomized control trials as one tool, should be used very seldomly, should only be used when there is an absolutely strategic um, value to using it, such as changing what is preponderantly believed to be true in a field, especially if what's preponderantly true, believed to be true is not true, um, then there, there, there is a, a valid basis for randomized control trials. And, and f the ethical issues of randomized control trials are really interesting to pursue, but just remember that for many organizations, there are long, long waiting lists. And so you're, they're going to be saying no to people. Um, so. Um, I don't see the ethical issue. If you're going to be saying no to more than half the people that they're going to be serving anyway to introduce randomness into whom they say yes to and whom they say no to, I don't see the ethical issue there. Um, I think the issue is there is an ethical issue to not taking, undertaking systematic inquiry into whether what you are doing is doing good. And that is, to me, a much higher ethical issue. And that is an ethical issue standard to which most nonprofits don't live up to. So I don't want to be understood as saying I think most organizations should undertake randomized control trials. In fact, I wrote an article called Daniel and the Rhinoceros in which I say very few should undertake randomized control trial. But getting yourself to the point where you could is going to do enormous good for the people you're serving because it's going to drive up the quality, sustainability, robustness, and effectiveness of your work. And Kate wanted to say something. <laughs> well, I, I, again, this was the prior question. In, in just looking at some of the organizations, even the organizations that we, uh, the board chose not to fund, one of the issues were they, they had no systematic processes. And, you know, I, again, when you ask the question on the application, they, you try to answer it, but you can see it's smoke. They really don't have the processes in place. And it's scary. And, in, in, you know, at first, just in talking about that inner rate of reliability, we had uh, our comptroller rated his section of the application independent of the rest of myself and, uh, and another worker that read the other part of the application. And then we met and really compared. Folks didn't have internal in controls, anything in place, and just in terms of the finances. It was frightening. And these are people I love. I, I, you know, I, 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 they're awesome people. This is hard work. It takes a lot of dedication to really put that in, into play. And it, it's not that we're bad people, it's just it wasn't part of the paradigm. And so really getting on board, just thinking, okay, where do I start? And that's where a lot of our agencies say, man, we wanna do this, but how do we jump in? Where do we start? And that's the beauty with Baldridge, you start where you're at and you figure out how to start putting in process from, in, you know, think about what you do. We've got intake, let's get a process for that. We've got, we, we need to get insurance, let's get a process for that. We need to do assessments, let's get a process for that. And then you monitor it on an ongoing basis, whoever in the organization is responsible for that, and tweak it as you see gaps in, in the service. So, you know, again, I just, I can't, and I had to do it on the uh, provider side as well. And so it, it's not easy, uh, but it does clear the way in order to um, the, the beacon. 
of her some light and some hope uh, to see to get better. So um, again, it, it's just persistence and determination. And I know you all have a bucket load of that. 